Um, I should say that I'd like to thank two colleagues who, who aren't here from the National Museum of Ireland, who are um, Dr Audrey Whitty and Dr Patrick Wallace, who let me have a look at the amazing Iranian art and Islamic art more broadly collections which the National Museum has, which not many people know about. I'd also like to acknowledge the research on this topic by Leonard Helfgott, Stephen Vernois and Abraham Thomas, whose uh, published work has been so incredibly useful. Now, how do I start? Looks, that seems to be the end. <laughs> Just a moment. Where's the show? Sorry, it's slightly different to my own machine. So. First one from beginning. <coughs> and there's a rogues gallery if ever there was one. <coughs> it must be a predictable outcome of Britain's international history that one of that nation's most important museums today retains quite such an outstanding collection of the art and material culture of Western Asia. Britain's long and increasingly dominant role in India's political history provided the means, the opportunity, to amass cultural treasures, as did other imperial contexts of British political and commercial involvement in the Middle East throughout the 19th century. Available opportunity, however, is no sufficient motive, and this paper will briefly sketch why, and perhaps more specifically exactly how, British design museums, such as the South Kensington Museum, only since 1899 known as the V&A, sought to acquire art objects of both modern and more ancient manufacture, from Qajar Iran in particular. It would be simplistic to describe this as an imperialist loot. For in spite of powerful commercial and strategic pressures from Britain and simultaneously Russia, as it happens, Qajar Iran was not part of the British Empire. In many instances, historical artefacts left Iran with the full permission of the Qajar administration, sometimes formulating Nasruddin Shah's express purpose to educate and indoctrinate the British museum-going consumer to go and buy contemporary Persian manufacturers. The exhibition, the exhibition policy of South Kensington Museum was not primarily to glory in Britain's global reach, but to awaken good taste and therefore percolate better design throughout British industry. The design movement in early 19th century Britain addressed a growing anxiety regarding the suspected poverty of national design, formulated by art pundits and tastemakers such as Henry Cole, Owen Jones and eventually Prince Albert. A national plan of action had ensued, opening the government schools of design, such as the London one in Somerset House in 1837, with growing teaching collections of art objects. The Great Exhibition of 1851, part of the Crystal Palaces on the right there, had put this embarrassing deficiency into international perspective, especially, and perhaps sensitively, relative to French design, which was seen as impressively superior. The historical design traditions of Asia were increasingly perceived as the necessary tonic for the aesthetic recovery needed in British industry, or so the pundits formulated it. Thus it was that Asian art was specifically sought after for Britain's teaching collections and design museums, for which the constant cycle of international exhibitions held in Western capitals throughout the 19th century would offer regular opportunities to buy objects. At the same time, though, the South Kensington Museum shrewdly had an agent collecting directly on their behalf within Iran. This was Robert Murdoch Smith, who was the Scottish director of the Indo-European Telegraph Company, who drew most particularly from Jules Richard, who was a French private collector attached to the Khadjar court, where he was known as Richard Khan. Art collection for design education was now a government matter for Victorian Britain. In 1877, the Science and Art Museum Act was passed, with institutions now in several cities of empire, London, Edinburgh, Liverpool and Dublin. The South Kensington Museum, or Dublin, up in the top right, you'll recognise what is now the National Museum, Scotland on the left and the bottom left, and the Royal Scottish Museum. Um, <coughs> South Kensington, opened in 1857, was now therefore part of a national network the older sister, as it were, to other museums of science and art. This was a family relationship in the inherently hierarchical sense, more of a sibling relationship, as demonstrated by distribution policy. 
When South Kensington made new acquisitions in great number, the excess of the new accessions were typically shared out to the younger sisters, but not necessarily evenly. Thus, the Dublin Museum of Science and Art benefited from this system, but it also acquired objects through more independent means. This, then, is a tale of British design poverty, uh, Scottish efficiency, <laughs> unscrupulous French agency, Codjar complicity, and ultimately, of course, Ireland's opportunity. In the early 1870s, South Kensington was not strong in Iranian art. Even though Iran's sophisticated design history was much admired by Victorian design pundits. This is a page from Owen Jones' Grammar of Ornament, published in 1856, where he has four or five plates of designs taken from different media of Iranian art. Now, the most obvious remedy to this rather small collection, in spite, combined with that ambition to, to uh, rely on this design tradition, the obvious thing would have been to go to an international exhibition and buy from an Iranian national pavilion. But as it happened, Iran had been neither officially nor even well represented by the late 1860s in international exhibitions. The Persian display at the Great Exhibition in 1851, seen on the left, now you can see three pavilions. I'm not sure, do I have a pointer or do I just have my, my own finger? Uh, we have the Greek pavilion, Turkey, Persia is on the corner. And this collection, or that small exhibition, was full of objects supplied only by British lenders, bar one. And the total valuation of the display was a mere £32, which wasn't a lot of money then either. Subsequent international exhibitions, Paris in 1855, London in 1862, didn't feature Iran either. And it wasn't until Paris 1867 that items were sent by the Iranian government for a national pavilion for the first time. And sure enough, South Kensington bought objects then. So did Dublin. Now, this was to change substantially from the 1870s onwards, as Nasruddin Shah took an increasing interest in Iran's international profile. He undertook three European tours, 1873, 1878 and 1889, each of which coincided with an official visit to an international exhibition in Vienna and twice Paris. By 1889, though, in that sort of 20 year period, South Kensington's Iranian collection had positively ballooned. This did not owe to a gradual accretion of small purchases, private donations from retired diplomats and concession entrepreneurs on furlough, but principally to our two individual actors. The first is Robert Murdoch Smith, a Scottish officer in the Royal Engineers with a keen interest in Iranian art and culture. For 20 years, 1865 to 85, he was based in Tehran as the director of the Indo-European or Anglo-Persian Telegraph. And the map on the left shows the route of the telegraph link, a crucial overline, overland line of imperial intercommunication which linked Britain, Britain to British India. London to Calcutta was a matter of 6,900 miles of wire and poles by traversing Iran, Russia and what was then Prussia. Thanks to this very strategic post, Murdoch Smith travelled regularly across Iran along that telegraph route where manned stations were placed at 60 kilometre intervals. He was also very familiar with members of the Qajar court and government and spoke Persian well. On a home visit in April of 1873, he contacted the South Kensington Museum and offered the director his services in acquiring art objects for the museum. He was an ideal candidate, having a close knowledge of how historical objects were or were not available for sale in Iran, where they might be found, or how they could be transported out of the country. So this is the first letter in our files from Murdoch Smith, where he writes from his club in Whitehall and addresses Henry Cole about um, what he would like to do. And his general position is that he could act as an agent for the museum. He suggests that he should spend the money in £100 rounds, send a monthly report, receive a small remuneration for each delivery, etc. So he sets out his um, proposition in this, um, in this letter. As if further persuasion might be needed, he also undertook a survey of the museum's current and somewhat puny holdings submitted the following month, May 1873. This re report makes rather sorry reading, but it is also deliberately framed thus in order to strengthen Murdoch Smith's proposition argument. So he goes through the Iranian objects in South Kensington medium by medium. So for woodwork, he says, this is a very fair collection as far as it goes. 
For musical instruments, he says, there are only two musical instruments in the museum, a whistle and a guitar. For metalwork, he says, in this class also, Persia is hardly represented at all, there being only three objects, and these not of peculiar interest or value. So he, he is sort of a little bit negative about any of the objects that were already in the collection, and it iterates that, the, that Iranian art and culture is not well represented. There are almost no textiles. There are almost no manuscripts. This makes no sense in terms of um, in Iranian art history. <clears throat> now, next, the next stage of his report, the cover letter to the report, rather, changes to a much more pressing tone, setting out the idea that there is an urgent reality at stake. There is open competition between private collectors and public museums something which remains a reality for 21st century art museums. Here, and in much of his subsequent correspondence over the years, Murdoch Smith conveys a moral certainty about the rectitude of collecting for a public museum, as opposed to a private drawing room, although both of which are located in the West. So, um, on the right we see... He, oh, I have a pointer. A very fine collection, he's talking about armour, might still be made, although every day... Um, Owing to increased communication with Europe, the number of articles of this class diminishes. There's absolutely no irony that he is part of the increased communication with Europe. He is one of the main reasons the articles are diminishing, but he, he doesn't see it that way. His, his perspective is, is completely different. So he says, in conclusion, I believe the present is probably the best time for acquiring specimens of Persian art before the introduction of the railways opens up the country. In fact, it was decades before that happened but he uh, sets his stall very clearly. His proposition matched the museum's needs handsomely and echoed neatly a letter sent by Henry Cole to the Lords of Committee five whole years previously, where he suggests that Middle Eastern-based British consuls should be issued with grants to go and buy money in their local stations. So the museum, of course, accepted his proposition and a 12-year relationship began. Monthly reports were sent from Tehran, with a five-year hiatus in 1878 to 83, and these are now filed at the museum. These documents document how um, Murdoch Smith, sorry, I'll go back, how he bought the objects, how he transported them by mule down to Boucher and then by steamer through the new Suez Canal to England, and he reclaimed the money by wire. So he was as good as his word. He did have an exceptional knowledge of how and where historic art collections were kept in the 19th century, and this is something that um, we don't know a whole lot about, but how art was, or how older objects were preserved, were they kept, was there any such thing as um, private collections by medium? Murdoch Smith's small comments answer a lot of our questions about ownership of objects in 18th and 19th century Iran. For example, he says there are no collections of objects for ordinary sale. You can't just go to Iran and buy it in a shop. Um, they do exist in private houses in every large town in the country but the family do not usually want to sell them unless there's been some sort of crisis. So he outlines that there is much material, much historic artefacts, but that it's not an easy matter to just go and get them. So he therefore adopted a wholesale approach. He sought out and courted private collections, private collectors. He offered to buy up their art collections, inherited maybe, or accumulated over a lifetime. And he wasn't alone in this. And his reports make occasional, slightly waspish notes about rival buyers who are also in Tehran at the same time, Western buyers, I should say. Baron Julius von Reuter in the Austrian legation, for example, was an arch enemy. <laughs> News of these collecting activities seems to have galvanised the release of historical material culture onto the art market in Iran and its subsequent westward exodus. Prices were beginning to rise in Iran and abroad for Persian art and Murdoch Smith was keen to act first. While settling a price for some ancient tiles with one Monsieur Nicola, who was a member of the French diplomatic delegation, Murdoch Smith mentions in his report how he expounded on the virtue of selling to a public institution. I told him casually one day when calling on him that the museum would probably be willing to purchase them, so he's trying to sound like he doesn't want the tiles too badly, and if so, that he had better sell them to an institution where all the world could see them, all the world in London, that is, um, rather than dispose of them otherwise. But shortly after, Murdoch Smith learned that Monsieur Nicola had discussed the very same tiles with another South Kensington man, a young Irish architect who was in Tehran as Her Majesty's Superintendent of Works for British Consular Buildings. This is Dublin-born Casper Purden-Clark, who was also 
buying objects of interest for the museum as it happens, but he had apparently given the game away by telling Nicolas just how much Persian tiles were fetching in Paris to the great irritation of Murdoch Smith. Regardless of the minor harumphing which ensued on this occasion. Purden Clark went on to a glittering museum career, if there is such a thing, to become Keeper of the Art Collections and then Director of South Kensington Museum in 1896 and later of the Metropolitan Museum in New York. In January 1865, 1875, Murdoch Smith struck gold and he bought an enormous quantity of objects of all media from one single collector. I recently examined in a cursory manner a very valuable collection of Persian articles belonging to Monsieur Richard, a French Muslim who has long been resident in Tehran. The collection comprises articles of almost every class and has been formed gradually in the course of nearly 30 years. Here we come to our second actor, Jules Richard. Born in France, Jules Richard came to Iran in 1844 and entered, entered the Qajar court thanks to a French woman called Madame Golsaz who worked for the imperial household. According to different accounts, she was a beautician for the palace women or a nanny to the crown prince and his sister. Anyway, within a short time, Richard had established himself too. He was a photographer at the court, taking daguerreotype portraits of the young Nasruddin Mirza, and thus introducing the silver plate photograph to Iran. And to my great sadness, I don't have any of them to show you because none of them survive, and I have no photograph of him either, which is deeply ironic. He further impressed Muhammad Shah by putting into use two cameras which had been sent as gifts from Queen Victoria and Tsar Nicholas, and he was rewarded with a position as a court employee as well as occasionally operating other Western gizmos, such as miniature steamships and lantern kites. Richard's roles at court were to teach French and English to the prince, and also photography, which, as most of us know, became a lifelong hobby for Nasruddin Shah. From 1851, Richard also taught at the European-style polytechnic Dar al in Tehran. He also acted as the Shah's interpreter and translator, and seems to have introduced some French style to interior decoration at the court, according to some slightly sidelong um, references. To the great vexation of the French consul, Comte de Gobineau, in uh, 1857, Richard converted to Shia Islam and to Iranian citizenship at the same time. Apparently, this was in avoidance of a sex scandal, where, which involved um, a Kurdish girl being discovered disguised as a boy in his entourage. And she said he'd kidnapped her, and he said... He said he'd bought her from her family, etc., etc. Um, so he took Bast, he took refuge at Abdelazim in Ray and converted to um, Shiism on the quick, double quick, and uh, <laughs> remained, uh, remained in Iran for the rest of his life, you know, married, had, has descendants, etc. Much later, in 1871, he was honoured by Nasruddin Shah, with no connection with the previous episode, and thereafter was known as Rishar Khan, remaining in Iran until his death in 1891. Now, it would seem from the gist of Murdoch Smith's reports that Richer was also a practised and practically professional wholesale, wholesale supplier of Iranian art to European buyers. He sold directly to visitors in Tehran and also via the international exhibition circuit in Europe. The collection he sold to Murdoch Smith in 1875 was not his lifetime's accumulation, levered away only by the rhetoric and cash of South Kensington idealism. When they met in early 1875, Murdoch Smith mentioned that Richard had been selling objects at the 1873 Weltach in Vienna. So he'd already been selling things in the pavilions. In the ensuing discussion of the sale um, of hundreds and hundreds of objects to the museum, Richard offered a suspiciously well-developed cost structure as to how the unit price would change by 10% if the museum bought on block or singly, and he sold um, close to 1,000 objects to the museum in one bulk sale for a... £1,137. And before that shipment left by mule for Bouchard, Richard had sold a further group for another £94 and he even threw in a third list of objects gratis. The total shipment reached 54 cases, with a further eight based on other purchases Murdoch Smith had made. This was enough material for the first dedicated exhibition of Persian art, held in 1876 at South Kensington. The introductory essay on the art history of Iran was composed by Murdoch Smith, proudly on the cover, with considerable advice apparently from Richard. And the text follows a predictable, I'm afraid, millennial master narrative of Iran's artistic and inherently racial genius, as one might, might have guessed. Now, I've included on the left some, um, the basis of ceramic objects in their collection, where you have the year is conveyed in the accession numbers. So, 1372, 13... 
1822 means object 1322, which came in in 1876. Bless the Victorian registrars. They didn't see 1976 as coming, so they just put an apostrophe 76. So we obviously also have objects which have 1976 written on them. So we have hundreds from that massive block accession which came in. And uh, as we were installing the new ceramics galleries last year, and I was installing Safavid ceramics, I had an almost creepy sense as I was installing like objects that I would look at the base for the accession number as we were ticking lists to make sure everything was in place. And when we had put them in order of like size, shape and provenance, you would look at the base and the number sequence was the same. So you would find 21, 22 and 23 because in 1875, Jules Richard and Rhoda Smith had done exactly the same thing and packed them in order by like sizes and origins. So it, it was a very organised affair which the museum has inherited in its accessions. <clears throat> now, a sort of quick word about the telegraph infrastructure and how this assisted the export of objects. Murdoch Smith's reports, which are fascinating documents for this, if you're interested in this level of detail, clarify that he was fortunate enough to get a good mule driver who gave them a good rate for transporting the objects overland to Bushire. He sort of comments that he wants all the cases to go in a steamer to sail on the 10th of September direct to London via the Suez Canal. So we know exactly how the objects move back. Now, continuous references, perhaps I'll uh, just go one further. Continuous references tell us that Richard Khan, as I said, had been collecting steadily, had been selling steadily over the years. He had agents active throughout Iran, bringing him a steady supply of objects to Tehran for sale. This included much rather very controversial objects, such as tiled mihrabs, manifestly taken by stealth from a mosque in one case, which Richard Khan had had buried outside Tehran until such time as he could swiftly sell it, which he did to South Kensington. Details such as this render Murdoch Smith's following observation rather extraordinary. He comments in his report, Isfahan has been so much ransacked of late years by European collectors and their Persian agents, that articles of value and interest, such as those in Mr. Richard's collection, are now rarely to be found. Forgetting that Mr. Richard's collection was assembled by one European collector and his Persian agents. So he's in an astonishing um, attitude to how the objects were coming and the conduct of others in exactly the same pursuit. Now, as the 62 case shipment prepared for transit, Murdoch Smith approached the Prime Minister, hoping to avoid having to unpack the hundreds of very carefully packed and padded fragile objects at customs. The hospitality of the response he received is also extraordinary. Before dispatching the caravan, I waited on His Highness the Sipe Salar Azem, and after explaining to him the nature and object of the collection, asked him to be kind enough to give me a circular order to all governors and customs house officials between Tehran and Bushire that the cases should not be opened or in any way detained or interfered with. I expressed my willingness to pay here the usual export duty for merchandise, shipped by English traders, of 5%, stating that my object in applying to His Highness was not to avoid the payment but to prevent the cases from being opened, now that they had been all carefully packed. He not only gave me the order I applied for, but embodied in it another that no duty should be levied, thereby saving the museum an expenditure of over £100. Now, what was the role and view of the Qajar state regarding this heritage exodus? Unlike the mullahs of the day, who strove to protect their sacred architecture from passing collectors, the Qajar state seems to have encouraged this transition. So Murdoch Smith sought to convince the Shah during an audience in December 1876. I recall to mind the remark of the total absence of per Persian productions made by His Majesty on visiting the London exhibition in 1873. And I pointed out, that is Murdoch Smith pointed out to uh, Nasruddin Shah, thanks to the efforts of the South Kensington Museum, the artistic manufacturers of Persia were now for the first time brought under the eyes of Europe, not in a transitory manner, as in not in an international exhibition, but as an integral part of a permanent museum in London with branches in other parts of England for which I think he is including Edinburgh and <laughs> Dublin. Um, such a special exhibition, I stated, was not only an honour to Persia, but was eminently calculated to stimulate her art industry and her commerce with the great markets of Europe. 
Nasruddin Shah had wished to see Iran's cultural achievements better represented on the world stage, as exemplified in these international exhibitions, where the manufacturers of different nation states were showcased in an international beauty pageant to the Western consumer, not the Western art historian. International design museums such as South Kensington offered similarly canny opportunities to convert British taste to Iranian imports. And it's been argued that those efforts led to the carpet boom of the 1880s and um, well, for forward in, uh, in Iran. Not so much desiring, maybe, that the British artist might emulate Iranian design, as someone like William Morris might have wished, Nasruddin Shah project projected that the British consumer would be sufficiently delighted by Iran's great design history as to rush out and buy an Iranian manufacturer, such as a contemporary carpet. So, perhaps, a heightened brand awareness of Iran's design was calculated to generate healthy consumption of Iranian exports abroad. To the same end, Nasruddin Shah and senior Qajar courtiers contributed gifts to the South Kensington Museum, which specifically focused on textiles and carpets. Um, it's not imaginable now. Now, the next Paris Expo, Exposition Universelle of 1889, coincided with the last European tour made by Nasruddin Shah, who was by now a known international figure, and you might even say character, now, when I was researching this paper, I little expected to find a better overlap of Irish <laughs> and Iranian interests or endorsements. This is, came in the Illustrated London News in 1889, and it's an, it's an endorsement for Bushmills, apparently made by <laughs> Nasruddin Shah, where someone says, this, Your Majesty, is a celebrated Bushmills whiskey, which you tasted in England and liked so much, I... And Nasruddin Shah says, I feel sure it will get the gold medal. <laughs> the bottom, the caption says, the prince was right. Bushmills has obtained the only gold medal. <laughs> so he's become an international figure and character by this point. But I couldn't believe it when I <laughs> really didn't expect anything so ridiculous. Um, by the next, um, by 1889, Jules Richard had amassed yet another considerable collection and shipped it for display and sale at the Persian Pavilion. A great quantity of this was again bought by South Kensington, and the year 1889, I believe, oops, sorry, no, okay, is yet another bumper accession date for our acquisitions. Here we return at last to South Kensington's relationship with its sister in Dublin, so I, I better hurry up so I can get it in. Now, Audrey Whitty, the curator for Asian and Ceramics in the National Museum of Ireland, has published on the transition to Dublin of 121 Indian and Iranian objects from the Paris exhibition in 1878, as selected by our friend Cassar Purden Clark. Later correspondence um, from Purden Clark in South Kensington to his colleagues in Dublin demonstrate the ongoing distribution system I mentioned of sharing artifacts, cast replicas among the nation's design museums. Eleven years later, 1889, a curator from the Dublin Museum, one T.H. Longfield, who has um, slightly scribblier handwriting than Murdoch Smith, as you may agree, he attended the 1889 Paris exhibition on a mission to purchase directly for Dublin. His correspondence with his director, the felicitously named Valentine Ball, describes his progress at this enormous public spectacle. So on the 25th of October, on the left you have a map of the colossal um, exhibition campus. He says, I arrived here on Tuesday and have been at the exhibition three days, but as you know, the place is so vast that it's impossible to get more than a general idea. So he sort of starts his letter, reports home. Three days later, he reports back on the acquisition of Iranian art. At the Persian court, I selected with much pains some glass and tiles to the amount of £32. And then we get some exhibition gossip. After making the purchase, I met Mr Lindo Myers of Savile Row, who told me that the SKM... Kensington Museum, had also purchased a large collection in the court, of which I suppose we will also get a portion. Thanks to this gossip, the Dublin curator remains aware of South Kensington's presence and future contribution, which does indeed follow. Charmingly, and I'm going slightly off the point now, the end of the letter uh, has a brief account of the most famous example of world fair architecture. He concludes by saying, I went to the top of the Eiffel Tower this afternoon and was much pleased with the sunset effect. From it. <laughs> so he's having quite a fun time. Now, further correspondence in the National Museum of Ireland Archives follows what happened next. South Kensington did indeed offer to send Dublin £300 worth of objects bought at the Iranian Pavilion, indicating that sibling hand-me-down system in full operation. Um, 
the, the letter is there. I haven't time to uh, read through it. At this point, he's offered £300 worth. Do you want it this financial year? Comes the sort of message from London. At this point, Longfield puts his foot down. It is he who needs to select objects to complement his own existing collection. And this is possibly the angriest minutes record I've ever read, where he goes, would it be well that we should be sent a list of what is proposed? Because they weren't even proposing to do that, they were just going to send a van. And, or that I should have an opportunity of inspecting and reporting to you on them, previous to their being selected, and that down the bottom underlined as I know better than they do in London what we are in need of. Um, the director sees his point. Longfield was shortly in South Kensington, conferring happily with Casper Purden Clark about some Syrian tiles for Dublin, making his own list of Jules Richard's Iranian objects from the Paris show, coming up to £305, 14 shillings and eight, which was sent by Van to Ireland. Now, <clears throat> am I, how am I for time? Give me a minute. <laughs> uh, the Dublin Museum of Science and Art was formed from three earlier institutional collections, the RDS, the Royal Dublin Society, 1731, the Royal Irish Academy, founded in 1785, and the Museum of Irish Industry, founded in 1847. Now, the encyclopedic nature of that formation survives today in the structure of the National Museum of Ireland, which has four divisions, which not many people know, art and industry, archaeology, based in Kildare Street, natural history, Marion Square, and Irish folk life, which is a museum in Turlock Park, County Mayo. Now, the Museum of Decorative Arts and History is based not in Kildare Street, as you see there, but in Collins Barracks, a grand and slightly severe military barracks built in the 18th century. Now named after the nation's hero and cork man, Michael Collins, the building was, of course, first built as the British Army base for Dublin. The collection of international decorative arts was original to the museum's 1877 conception as that Dublin Museum of Science and Art. But increasingly, from the late 19th century onwards, the importance of Irish identity, Celtic Irish heritage, guaranteed that Irish antiquities have long held patriotic primacy in the museum's exhibition space. That sort of space was at a great premium after 1922, when Leinster House was no longer home to the RDS, but to Dáil Éireann, the um, Parliament. So there was less exhibition space and um, Irish heritage was more important to display in the early 20th century. The 1997 opening of Collins Barracks has brought much of the decorative arts division back on display, including a visible storage section, a new display of the Asian collection of Alfred Bender. This was a major bequest given by a Jewish Dubliner who emigrated to San Francisco for an impressive career in insurance brokership, eventually left his impressive art collection to Dublin in honour of his Irish mother. Collins Barracks has a good, small um, range of Islamic art collections, from Kashan luster tilework to Qajar portraiture, which is only coming to light now that it is back on display again, which is mainly thanks to Dr Audrey Whitty. Some of these objects came via solitary collectors and travellers, such as the Duke of Leinster, who collected Japanese art, but a little bit of Middle Eastern, or from the museum's direct purchases at international exhibitions. The collection, and now the nation, certainly um, <coughs> benefited from its membership of that science and art museum club, and its erstwhile status as a city of empire. This may be hard to reconcile with 20th century political and national identity, but maybe in a 21st century post-IMF bailout Ireland, we can take the long view. Thank you.